I, I would like to think that having been an economist for so many years of your life, as an economist, the, the economist eye, what, what are some of the outstanding things you've seen maybe just driving around in Well, in what, is, what is very impressive when you get into Nairobi um, is just see the infrastructure. I think that it's very impressive infrastructure that, that you have. You see the businesses that are also all dotted all over the, the city. And of course, you have uh, significant industrial capacity uh, in, in Kenya and, and one of the larger economies in, in the region. So uh, I think it's quite impressive. You came to represent the Republic of Ghana in the inauguration of the fifth president of Kenya, Dr. William Ruto. How was that event for you? Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, it was a successful event uh, from my perspective and the perspective of Ghana. I think that the successful uh, event that we witnessed today is not just a Kenyan success story, but it's an African success story. Uh, because whenever we have peaceful transitions of power uh, from you know, one to another uh, peacefully, it is a success. We always remember the old days of difficult transitions. And so when we, since we've embarked on this democratic journey, uh, every step, every milestone is very, very important. And Kenya is one of the bulwarks of democracy uh, in, on the continent. And so even though you had very uh, uh, interesting elections and, and very contentious elections and all of that, at the end of the day, uh, the results were accepted. There was a successful transition and a successful inauguration of President William Ruto today. Uh, so it was an African success story. And so I am very happy about that. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. When we're looking at Kenya and Ghana, mostly we, we, we know a lot about Ghanaian movies, <laughs> Ghanaian music, right. but from a diplomatic point of view, what is the relationship right now between Kenya and Ghana? Well, we have very good relations, and these relations date back uh, from you know the independence days where both were two countries that obtained independence relatively early. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president, and Jomo Kenyatta, your first president, were good fr friends, and they engaged in the independence struggle against the colonialists and came out successful and 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 got our country's independence um, with their movements and so on. But I think that, um, you know, su subsequently, uh, the relations between Kenya and Ghana have been growing. There is a, a sizable Kenyan community yes. <laughs> in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And because, of course, of Kenya Airways, which has a direct flight from Accra to Nairobi, uh, which is really the flight I came on and will be returning on tomorrow, uh, there's a lot more commercial uh, links now between uh, Kenya and Ghana. Okay. Yes. And you, you mentioned Kwame Nkrumah. I do remember. I was a very. I was not born yet, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember there's this vision he had of having the United States of Africa. Yes. And we we have policies geared to kind of make Africa a free trade region. Yeah. Do you think that's a vision we can still kind of imagine for Africa? And what are the, some of those challenges limiting us to get yeah. there? I think, you know, in a sense, people like Nkrumah were a bit ahead of their time in, in terms of the vision that they had. Uh, and I think that in those days, um, they, they, the leaders of Africa uh, were generally of that view that we needed to cooperate, we needed to be united, um, and, and all of that. And I think this is today manifesting itself in the African continental free trade area. and the idea that we've created a free trade area, the largest free trade area in the world. Mm -hmm. And this is because it is important that African countries trade amongst ourselves, because our trade has largely been 
with our colonial masters in terms of the pattern of, of trade. And, you know, the more we trade amongst ourselves, we, we believe that the more jobs can be created and, and, and all of that. And, and I think that it is an idea whose time has come. Ghana is, of course, hosting the secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement mm. area. And, and so we are very, very passionate about it. And I think that there is a lot um, of opportunity and potential for us to realize it. You talked about bottlenecks yes. that could be there uh, in, in, in that. And I think that in, in the area of trade, um, the, the linkages in terms of logistics and transportation mm -hmm. will be key bottlenecks. One of the areas where we had thought was a major bottleneck was in terms of payments and settlement. Mm -hmm. But recently, a few months ago, I, lo I launched the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, which was uh, backstopped by, uh, it's backstopped by Afriexim Bank, working in collaboration with the central banks. And that allows someone from Kenya to buy something in Ghana in Kenyan shillings. And doesn't, you don't have to worry about you know, buying a third currency like the US dollar to then trade. You can trade in your local currency. This is a major innovation, really major. And, and, and I think that that will help us bridge the, 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 the gaps that we have in, in, in the payment and settlement area. Um, so, you know, it's important that we open up the skies mm -hmm. uh, for, for air flights across the continent. It should be an open skies policy uh, and, and all of that. And we need to build up the infrastructure links, you know, across rail and road across the countries. Uh, but I, I believe that uh, we, we have the opportunity yes. uh, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the dreams of the Nkrumahs and the Kenyatas and so on in, in the early 60s, late 50s, I mm -hmm. think one, are ones that we have the ability in our generation to realize that yes. potential. And as we're talking about trade, we know that um, most of the trading in our continent currently has been affected by inflation yeah. currently in our country, yeah. something that has also been um, really affected by COVID-19, which yeah. hit um, the, the entire globe from yeah. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. How is Ghana dealing with these challenges? Yes, I think that um, you are quite right. The cost of living across the world mm -hmm. has just increased yeah. phenomenally. Um, and this, I mean, is coming on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic, which really disrupted global supply chains and increased shipping costs almost 10 to 12 fold. Uh, and just when we thought we were recovering, then you had Russia and Ukraine yes. come on top of that. And then you had this major increase in energy costs as a result and food prices. Um, and you know, so it, it, it has affected virtually every country. And Ghana has been no exception. And I'm sure Kenya has not been an exception either because food prices and energy prices have, have gone up and they have inflationary consequences and exchange rate consequences. And they've really squeezed budgets in, 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 that, in that respect. Of course, in Ghana, um, we're trying to deal with it in this, in this uh, context of very squeezed and tight budgets. On the monetary policy side, the central bank is trying to contain inflation uh, through their monetary policy. There have been a number of interest rate increases to try to, to contain the situation. Um, government continues to offer free senior secondary school education uh, to, to our citizens, uh, which has also continued to lessen the burden on families uh, to, in terms of uh, uh, costs of living. Otherwise, without it, it would have been much worse. But ultimately, you deal with this crisis by expanding your production. Mm -hmm. If it's a food crisis, then we need to increase food production. Uh, and that is how we want to tackle it mm -hmm. uh, in, in Ghana. The energy side is a, a little bit more difficult uh, since we are net importers of oil and that we are taking things really at, at the dictates of the international mm -hmm. market. So we, we're hoping that uh, sooner or later the Ukraine crisis will abate and, and bring down energy prices yeah. for all of us. But I think that um, government is, is continuously uh, looking at ways to deal with it. 
Um, something else, it's, it's really good that we had this opportunity to speak to you as an economist, and not just an economist, someone who's renowned globally. I think most people don't know that you have worked for the Central Bank of Ghana, you have been recognized in the United States, and just literally across Africa. And I just wanted you to let me know, um, the current president, William Ruto, he won on the economic model of the bottom-up economic model. So he's bringing in the local traders and the youth. As an economist, what do you think about this particular model, not just for Kenya, but for the broader African continent? Oh, yes, uh, th thank you very much, Judah. I think the bottom-up economic model is just a model of inclusiveness. Uh, you know, so you are looking for inclusion. And I think that that is fundamentally a good model to go. If you, uh, what you have seen in Africa since independence is you've had development without inclusion. So you, you get to a stage after 50, 60 years of independence, and then you are like, look, so many people don't even have a bank account. So many people, you know, don't have access to electricity. So many mothers in villages die when they are given birth because they don't have access to blood supply and so on. You know, so many people are excluded from the economic system. Yes. So if you are trying to, to transform an yeah. economy, uh, you cannot transform it on the basis of exclusion because that substantial population would be amongst those who are excluded and they will operate in the informal sector largely. Mm -hmm. So I think that the idea that President Ruto has about a bottom-up model mm -hmm. in terms of development is a good one yeah. and, and, and I think it's, it's one that uh, many African countries should, should be emulating if mm -hmm. they are already not doing so. Yeah. I think back in the early 2000s, I know that Ghana's inflation was at around 40%. Yes. And through your efforts, and obviously the efforts of other people, it yeah. came back to around 10%. Yes. What other tips would you have for, well, I, I think, for leaders in this continent well, to, I think, to do but, the same? But, okay, I mean, we, we were able to bring down inflation, yeah. but inflation has also gone up again yes. with, yes. with the recent um, increases in food prices and fuel prices. Our inflation now stands at 31 percent, you know, and, and, and so on. But I think fundamentally you need good f mix of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Uh, in, inflation ultimately is a monetary phenomenon, but it's the fiscal that can really drive the monetary uh, side of it. So if you can uh, work to make sure that your balances on the fiscal side mm -hmm are not excessive, yeah. right? Your deficits are not excessive. It's like that you don't have to resort to monetary financing of that deficit to then create pressures on prices. Uh, then you are able to contain inflation. We implemented an inflation targeting framework, uh, one of the f few countries in Africa at the time, to do inflation targeting. And it, it has proven very successful. Uh, but of course, um, that alone is not sufficient. Uh, you have to look at the output side as well to make sure you increase production and productivity so that your supply side is also supporting yes. the monetary policy. Yeah. yeah. Um, during your time as vice president, the government has also worked hard to put in place a digital, digital agenda yeah. in Ghana. Yeah. How does that translate to the economic value for the people of Ghana and why would that also be something all countries in Africa should work towards? Yeah, thank you very much Judah. I think that it is true that uh, in Ghana we have really focused and we are pursuing digitalization mm -hmm. as an economic strategy. Yeah. Um, when you look at the, the world and the way the global economy is moving, um, you've had your first uh, industrial revolution and second. I mean, we are now in a fourth industrial revolution globally. Yeah. And it is a revolution which is a digital revolution. It is a revolution that is based on data and systems. You know, if you are an economy in this world and you don't digitalize, you are going to be left behind. And Africa has been left behind 
too, for too many of these uh, periods. And so we, I believe, and it is very, very important that uh, digitalization is a key for African countries to leapfrog, in fact, many of the advanced economies. But we digitalize not for its own sake. Mm -hmm. It's not a technology. Mm -hmm. But you digitalize to solve problems. You digitalize to solve problems. And so we're pursuing digitalization uh, to formalize the economy, to build a more inclusive economy, to deal with corruption, mm -hmm. and to provide services to our people very efficiently from the government side. Right? So you look at these pillars, and, and you're saying, look, a lot of people are excluded from the economy. You don't even know who is who. So you do digital IDs for your people. So you have unique identities for everybody. Once you have unique identities for everybody, you solve a lot of problems. You cannot have ghost workers on the public payroll, yeah. right? Because a ghost cannot have a fingerprint, yes. right? <laughs> so you, you solve that problem, right? You, you, have a, you have unique identity, you soon solve voter issues, you know, like who gets on the voter register. You know, how can you put names on the voter register that don't belong? If there is a unique identity, you can't. You can't. You can't. You know, so you solve that, that problem. You know, we had an issue of address systems in Ghana, a, an effective address system where you can have an address to, for every location, whether it's on water or land, you know, whether it's a mansion or a shack. We need addresses because you need to know where your people are. Now, we had therefore decided to go digital. And so Ghana now has a digital address system. Every part of the country, land or water, mansion or shack or wherever, yeah. has a unique digital address, mm -hmm. which we have ruled out in the country. You know, it solves a big, big problem. Because even in terms of e-commerce, if you want the delivery of food to your house and you don't have an address, uh, it becomes a problem. Yeah. Right? So, with rolling out the digital address system, we are solving a lot of problems. Directions to places, you know, because when you go and apply for a job, they ask you what is your address and all of that. You know, so you, you, you really solve. Then you talk about financial inclusion. We decided to, to do mobile money interoperability. It's not just interoperability between the telephone companies, uh, say between Vodafone and Airtel or Tigo, whatever but interoperability between the mobile wallet and the bank account. That is a different type of interoperability. And so we've done that in Ghana, which means that everybody that has a mobile money account practically has a bank account. Yeah. And, and so we are solving that problem of a lack of financial inclusion by doing this type of interoperability. We were the first country in the continent mm -hmm. to do so. And it means that today it's very, very easy for anybody to open a bank account in Ghana. Very, very easy. You know, you have your national ID card, you get on your mobile phone, and then just dial a USSD code, choose one of the banks, and off you go. You op mm -hmm. You've opened a bank account. Because yeah. with the national ID, they have all the KYC they need on you. Yeah. You don't need to go to the bank, fill any forms, and all of that. It, it, it's done. You see what I mean? Today you, you can sit at home, buy your electricity units on your mobile phone. You can find out which car has insurance or not. Just dialing a USSD on your mobile phone. You can apply for virtually all the government services online, pay online. It makes life easier for our people. So we are pursuing digitalizing and, and then integrating the databases. You don't want the databases to sit in silos. And so we, by integration of the databases, you then get the value out of the digitization process. So you, you will be able to tell. And one of the added things that we will get is domestic revenue mobilization. Mm -hmm. Because you, you'll be able to tell who has paid their tax, who hasn't paid their tax, and, and make it easy for people to file taxes digitally uh, and, and all of that. So I believe that uh, digitalization is the way for African countries to go. Uh, and, 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 and we are pursuing this, and we are using it to solve problems and actually leapfrogging over many advanced countries. Yeah. 
uh, in this area. I mean, a lot of people seem to think that African countries cannot be ahead of the advanced countries. My view is very, very different. In fact, in this area, we are leading the way. For example, Ghana, in the area of drones for the delivery of medical supplies, blood, vaccines to poor areas. Uh, we have implemented drones. Rwanda started it. But we today are the largest medical drone delivery service in the world, the mm. whole world. Impressive. Yeah, we, 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 we have drones flying all over the country. Each center is doing at least 100 flights a day. At delivering medicines and so on. Uh, this is technology, and we can use those technologies to solve problems. By the way, I had to. I, I found out about this in Silicon Valley, and I said, "Look, this is more, in, in, you know, would be more useful to us, mm -hmm. and we should implement it very quickly." And which is what we did. You should take technology and use it to solve problems. And I think that this is what we are doing. And so, digitalization can reduce corruption, people can apply for a passport without going to pay a bribe, can apply for a driver's license without, you're helping the poor, you're helping the marginalized, the vulnerable, those who don't have connections, you know, and yeah. those are the people you help with digitalization. So you reduce corruption. And that is where I think we can increase productivity, create jobs. So many people are, you know, selling on the internet now because there's an address system and they can, their payment system also, people can pay with their mobile money as here in Kenya. And, you know, so Africa is actually leading in many of these areas mm -hmm. globally. It's, it's really interesting, yeah. particularly you putting that digitization is not just for the sake of it, but having it find solutions. That's right. And um, looking at the enthusiasm you have about everything you're talking <laughs> about, and I just went through your portfolio, everything you've done, and from the time you're studying at Oxford, and I'm like, do you ever get time to rest? Because <laughs> I know as vice president, you're currently sitting in different boards. Yeah. I, I also believe you're consulting for the Central Bank <laughs> of Ghana. Well, when do you rest? Well, basically, I, I think that uh, Actually, my wife also asked me that question. <laughs> do you ever rest? Yeah. You know, I enjoy what I do, mm -hmm. uh, and I do, of course, find time to rest. But the, the problems are so many, and I'm, I'm trying as much as possible to help my boss deal with a lot of these problems because uh, you inherit them and you, you, you have to find solutions. And for me, that is why I'm in politics, mm -hmm. right? Just to make sure you can help people solve problems. Yes. Uh, and that is that is so. I, I I always say that maybe I'll rest later when we mm -hmm. when we are we are done with more. But uh, I, I, I'm okay. I'm yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Ghana will be having um, general elections in 2024. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure many Ghanaians are fronting your name to be the successor of the current president. <laughs> um, is am I right? Are you? Are you working towards that as well? Well, I think right now I'm just focused on helping my boss, the president, Nana Kofuado, mm -hmm. fulfill his vision yes. and, and deliver on his agenda. Uh, we, we don't really have too much time for thinking about 2024 mm. right now. Mm. I think that you know, if you get to 2024 and you don't have a record, mm -hmm. you will have nothing to, yes. to campaign on. So right now, we are focused on that, and we don't know what the future holds, mm -hmm. but we'll focus on the work yeah. for now. And lastly, as an economist, your main job is finding solutions, particularly on economies. And one of the biggest problems we're having in the country is having leaders who, it's not that they're not working, but they're diagnosing the problem wrongly. Right. How do you advise leaders? Right now we are moving into a new government in Kenya. How do leaders move forward to find better solutions to problems? Well, I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question in a way uh, for me to advise other leaders because they, they can also advise me, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, so, so but, but I, I think that um, as in, in many, many um, issues to do with the, the, the economy, the solutions are not really rocket science mm -hmm. in, in, in a sense. Uh, it's about diagnosing the problem in the first place. Yes. Uh, if you misdiagnose, you will miss, you know, treated yes. and you, you will not medicate properly mm -hmm. and you'll definitely maybe worsen the problem. So understanding the problem, talking 
to people who are experts in the field. You don't necessarily have to be an expert in the field as a policymaker, but mm -hmm. you can speak to the experts in the field and get their views on these problems. And, yes. and, but you have the, the, the sense uh, to, to say, okay, this is good advice, I'm going to follow it, mm -hmm. and, and, and then see what, what, what it, how it goes. But mm -hmm. I think that we should be consultative in, in, in how we approach issues uh, and, 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 and listen to advice from mm -hmm. the experts. And maybe is there any goodwill message to the current president, President William Ruto? Well, uh, well, uh, I would. I I've, I just met him uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, it's I guess to congratulate him uh, for his victory and his inauguration. I just want to wish him very well. Uh, this is a major task, a major burden, but I know that God will see him through. Uh, he, he, he's a very smart man, uh, he's been vice president yes. <laughs> for a while, so he knows what to do. Uh, and, and so we're praying for him and we're wishing him the very, very best. Yes. Uh, and and we, 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 we are looking forward hmm. to, to what he does for, for Kenya. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.